The second week, our children's book was called Let's Talk About Race by Julius Lester. And our parent resource was So You Want to Talk About Race. Each of these books, along with the parent resource, are on our First Presbyterian Church website. And also, if you are unable to get the parent resource, we would encourage you to either listen to one of the video interviews with the authors or to read one of the articles about these parent resources. Today, our children's book is called She Stood for Freedom. It's the story of Joan Mulholland, a civil rights hero. I should also mention that all of these children's books are part of a collection um, from the International Civil Rights Museum here in Greensboro. The parent resources are actually from my personal collection on my shelf at church. Um, and I would say fortunately and or unfortunately, many of them are unavailable right now. They're out of stock if you go to um, any of the online bookstores, but I hope that you will stay on a list to get the books and or once again, check the website for the articles and the videos. She stood for freedom. I'm not gonna actually read every single page of this book and I would encourage you to get it and to read all of it because it's basically um, the life and the learnings of Joan. Joan grew up in Arlington, Virginia, at a time when there was a lot of discrimination and hatred against blacks. They weren't allowed to eat at the same lunch counter, sit at the same place on the bus, or go to the same school. Segregated bathrooms at gas stations and stores were part of everyday life. It was even against the law for whites and blacks to worship together. That was just life in the South. In church, Joan was taught that God loved all of God's children, no matter the color of their skin, and that we should treat one another the way we wanted to be treated. In school, Joan's class stood at attention to sing Dixie, and she memorized the Declaration of Independence, which says all men are created equal. The rules, the long summer days in Georgia offer Joan and her friend Mary great opportunities for adventure, but the rules were clear. They were not allowed to go beyond the Coca-Cola bottling plant, and the black area was absolutely forbidden. Let's go, said Mary. I don't want to, said Joan. We can't go there. Grandma said so. Come on, urged Mary. I dare you. Joan knew she was breaking the rules, but Mary had dared her, so together they went down the dirt road that ran along the railroad tracks and turned off to where the blacks lived. Joan's grandmother was poor, but not as poor as the blacks in their area. I think the people here are afraid of us, Joan said. She thought it was strange that no one wanted to be seen anywhere near them and hid themselves behind their houses and doors. When Joan and Mary reached the black schoolhouse, Joan stopped and stared. It was not like the brand new brick schoolhouse for the white children. This was a one-room shack. Joan's soul was rattled. This is not fair. She knew that despite what her family and society believed, that separating people because of the color of their skin was wrong. And she decided she was going to do something about it when she had a chance. Joan graduated from Annandale High in 1959 and wanted to go to college. She did not want to go to Duke University, but her mother insisted because Duke was a segregated school. She didn't want her daughter to have colored classmates or a roommate who was black. 
Joan began attending Duke University in the spring, she was invited to join a demonstration in Durham. A demonstration was a chance for people to get together in public and show that they felt strongly about a cause. Joan saw it as a way to try to change people's opinions about segregation, but she knew that if she did, her Georgia family might never speak to her again. She would never be able to go back to the life she knew. Could she do what was right, even if it was not easy? Joan joined the civil rights movement in 1960. Thousands of other people from across the South and the country were standing up for equal rights for everyone. The administration of Duke University could not believe that a white Southern woman would join the civil rights movement. So Joan left Duke and returned to Northern Virginia where she participated in many sit-ins. A sit-in is a special kind of demonstration where people sat on seats at a lunch counter to protest injustice. She made new friends at Howard University in Washington and helped integrate the lunch counters in her hometown. That summer, she and her friends demonstrated all over the area, but nothing would fully prepare Joan for what would take place in 1961. It was a warm day in May when two interstate passenger buses rolled out of Washington, D.C., heading to New Orleans with black and white riders in the seats. It was called the Freedom Rides, and the people on the buses were called Freedom Riders. They wanted to draw attention in a peaceful way to unjust segregation in the South. Joan's friend Hank Thomas was one of the riders. Then a photo appeared in the newspaper. Joan was speechless. There was Hank in Anniston, Alabama, standing in front of a bus that was on fire. The Freedom Riders had gotten attention, but not the kind they were hoping for. The Freedom Rides seemed all but over. Joan and her friends wanted to keep the Freedom Rides going. They flew to New Orleans, took a train to Jackson, and went into the train station together. They were arrested and sent to the Hines County Jail. After Joan was released, Joan stayed in Mississippi and attended college, a black school. Not everyone was happy that Joan was there. Some of the students didn't trust her because they had never been so close to a white person before. Joan received letters in the mail from both people who supported her and people who said she was a traitor. The state of Mississippi even tried to, tried to close the college because of Joan, but they couldn't. Joan went to class and studied hard, and in 1962, she was invited by her friends to join the All Black Sorority, a student organization for women, Delta Sigma Theta. She even got to meet Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Joan started working on other large demonstrations that were being organized. She hoped the March on Washington would be a success. On the morning of August 28, 1963, nearly 250,000 Americans, including Joan, listened as Martin Luther King Jr. spoke on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. It would become known everywhere as the I Have a Dream speech. During part of his speech, he said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. It was a dream that Joan and many others believed in. Joan promised herself that she would continue to work to achieve that dream, no matter how long it took.
The summer of 1964, also known as Freedom Summer, people in the civil rights movement wanted to help as many black people as possible register to vote. Some people were attacked or arrested for trying to help and three of them were killed. Joan knew the work she and her friends were doing helped to give the activists in the civil rights movement the strength to press forward. They knew that good always triumphed over evil. They would succeed as long as they never quit. Joan graduated from college in 1964 and a few years later started a family. She continued to participate in events like the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965 and the Meredith March in 1966. The day that President Lyndon B. Johnson said, and we shall overcome, was a powerful moment for Joan. Everyone would now have the opportunity to vote. Joan became a teacher's assistant in Arlington, Virginia, and made sure her kids learned the lesson she knew was most important. You can never go wrong by doing what is right. It may not be easy, but it will always be right. Many people say that Joan is a hero, but she'll tell you she's not. She says, I'm as ordinary as they come. I saw something was wrong and I decided to do something about it. It takes all of us to make a difference. We just have to make the choice. What can you do? You can do the same thing Joan did when she was a little girl in Georgia. She decided to do what was right. Anyone can make a difference, Joan said. You don't need to be a Dr. Martin Luther King or a Rosa Parks or a Ruby Bridges. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. Find a problem, gather some friends together, and go out and fix it. Remember, you don't have to change the world. Just change your world. She stood for freedom, the story of the civil rights hero, Joan Mulholland. Our parent resource for today is white fragility. Why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. There once again is also an article and a video podcast on our website about the book White Fragility. The activity that I would like to encourage you to consider doing this week if you are in the Greensboro area is to come and be part of our God's Dream mural at First Presbyterian. On Sunday during the children's message, I talked about the book God's Dream, which is by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And in the book, we talk about what it means to vision together and dream about what God's world would look like if we all stood together, loving and caring about one another. After the mural is finished, we will display it on our Elm Street playground so that not only we as a church can enjoy the work of our children, but that it will also be a sign and symbol to our community that we would like to be a part of making God's dream for our world to come true. I hope that you will continue to talk and learn and listen together as a family and be involved, like Joan, in doing acts of love and compassion and doing what is right in our world. Take care.